Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. Hey. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hey. You. Help. Over here. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, please. Help. Help me. Sit. Sit. Please sit. Help. Mm -hmm. Is everything okay? No, everything's not okay. There are men here, and they're watching me. Oh, shit. Shit. Yes, just look at me. Just look right at me. Everything's going to be fine, but I'm in a lot of shit, okay? So I need your help. Oh, good. You have a friend. Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, I've known my first guest today as an actor who's been in numerous films, a writer, a director, and a producer. Now, you've seen this fellow receive raves for his stage play Zora and Paul, a fictional conversation between Zora and Neil Houston and Paul Robeson. And he's been contracted to write the Bessie Coleman story. I can't wait to see that Bessie Coleman story. Can't wait. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ken Zagos. Ken, welcome and welcome to the Actors' Choice, my brother. And thank you for inviting me here. I'm happy to be here. Indeed. Yeah. What was your, where were you born at? Let's, let's, get, let's hit that one first. I was born in Stockbridge, Georgia, the home of Daddy King, father of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Wow. Wow. Stockbridge. Wow. Wow. Yes. So let's get right to it. What got you started in this business? What was it like? Uh... You know, ever since I was a kid, I was always what my parents used to say I would be, you know, I throw the little party, you know, and we didn't. I always wanted to make people happy. You know, I saw my grandmother crying one time and I wanted to make her smile. And so I did. So I set out to do that all my life. All right. 1983, you got your first IMDb credit as a writer on Laverne and Shirley. Remember that? <laughs> oh, man. We going back, aren't we? Yes, we are going back. <laughs> Way, yes. way back. <laughs> yeah, way back. I actually wrote one of the first black writers to write for Laverne and Shirley. Yes, most people don't know that, but yes, I was. They do now. We just <laughs> told them. We just let them know. And then, sir, in 1985, you got your first IMDb active credit. It was a well-known program called The Twilight Zone. You Twilight. and Rob Sterling got together. <laughs> yes, yes, loved it. And I was a fan of Twilight Zone when I was a kid. Wow. And the way you got on it. You got it. Okay. Fast forward to 1987. And there you got several roles. One was a nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. Remember yep. that? Yep. I do. I do. Didn't know what nightmare on Elm Street was when I auditioned for it, but I'm <laughs> glad I got it because it still pays bills. Pays those bills, right? Exactly. And then the same and back same year, a little series, a little series got out that year. Uh, called What's Happening, because you was in it. <laughs> What's Happening it. Now. Not happening Now, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's Get Happening that Now. Thank you, sir. I used to watch What's Happening when I was a kid. Then when I got uh, an older kid, I was on the show. 22 episodes? 22 episodes. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> me and Martin Lawrence, by the way. Here's a question. Back in those days, what was it like trying to get work? It was hard, but it was a different time than it was now. Back then, when we could, we went and met casting directors. There was something called a general interview. And for me, there wasn't very many uh, roles out there for Blacks. And so I, that's how I got into writing. I decided to write my roles, what I was proud of. And so, but it was very difficult. You know, it was, but you know what you was created and you went out and you did it. If you loved it, you wasn't too happy about, you, you weren't too happy about what wasn't there, but you got up every morning and lived and you went out and you did it. That's how I've always seen it. Wow. What kind of roles were you looking for? Uh, at the time I was just looking for a role, <laughs> you know, but I was just looking for a role, but I do know there was a couple of times that I turned stuff down because I, I didn't feel it. And, you know, and because I had such an upbringing of being proud about things, I went out for everything. And if I didn't feel it, I didn't do it. But at the same time, you didn't get everything. 
some of the changes that you've seen in the industry. What are some of the changes that yeah. you, I, I would like for the young people, uh, those coming up now, even myself, you don't have to wait for Hollywood to discover you. You can go out there and do what you like to do and then when, and keep doing it. There's no expiration on date or when you should stop acting, stop writing, stop being an artist. You can continue to do it. And if you do your work right, do it proudly, then you don't have to be discovered by Hollywood. Hollywood will come to you. Ken, you must be talking about yourself because that's exactly who you are. <laughs> <laughs> you do it well, do it well. Okay, 2016. You directed, wrote, and produced a short drama film called The Secret Weapon. What was that experience like? It dealt with children. Most of the things that I do deal with children. Most people don't know that it was children, Black children in 1963 that gave the power back to the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write that story. I wanted to write a piece of our history that is very rarely seen by children to show the pride of children and to make sure that they can see their investments in history. Got you, got you. You're still acting, obviously, even yes. though you're directing. Yes. You got any acting roles on the, on the hill? There is one acting role. I just did something two weeks ago and it's supposed to be, and I'm not supposed to talk about it. It's called, but it's, it's called Ralph. It's <laughs> called Ralph. So that's how I'm <laughs> It's called Ralph, and it's, it's the kind of role that I won't normally play, mm -hmm. but it had to do with someone I took a chance on, and when they got to the level to give me something, now they're taking a chance on me. Okay. But here comes 2020, nice little year. And you go, you did, you did a movie called The McHenry Trial. Don't judge a kid by his hoodie. Right. It's about a 14-year-old kid brilliant 14 year old kid that went on and, and passed the bar at 14. And his first case was defending his father who was accused of murder. And I wanted to show the brilliancy of our young black people without any drugs, without any of the other things. And so that's what it, uh, it is, this kid to go head to head with this powerful attorney and wins. You were the director, writer, producer. Yes. 76 wins, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Awards. Seven and six. Yes. Damn good. Woo! 11 I, nominations. I, I, I just think that, you know, sometimes we can't complain about how our story is told by someone else telling them. Yes. I have choose not to complain about it, but go out and do it myself. I know how, what the pride is in our communities. I know there's gold in our young people. So I don't have to complain about somebody else writing something. Hell, get out there and write it yourself. Guess what? We just right. happen to have a little clip. Roll it, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> some help. Where's your phone? Where's your phone? Hey, hey, don't die on me. Hold on, Harv. Hold on. Where is that film at right now? Right now, um, what I did is I wanted to do three short films. Yes. And I wanted to do in three different uh, genres of film. Because once I finished the third one, then I want to present myself to a production company, to a, uh, 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 unit, a studio to direct my stories. Because then they're going to say, well, you never did this before. You never did that before. Well, bam, I done did it three times and won awards. What's your next excuse? Give me my money so we can do this thing. Say it loud. Say it loud. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Um. And here you are now. The secret yeah. weapon yesterday is today. What yes. caused you to take on that project, sir? Like Those I said, t-shirts. Those t-shirts. Yeah, because of the children. 
because yes. most people do not know that children gave the power back to the civil rights movement. Children inspired the passage of the 1964 children, I mean, uh, civil rights case. Mm -hmm. Children gave the momentum back for the march to Washington in 1963. It was children, black children, who said, I will not give up. So what's happening yesterday in 1963 is still happening today. Yes. And so we have to look for our future to change this, and it's the children. And so that's why I wanted to do the story, because we just had to do with children. Right. They need to know their culture, where they came from, how they got yeah. here. How they got here. If you yes. don't know your culture, if you cannot connect the dots of your history, mm -hmm. because when you connect the dots of your history, you draw a line. And that line is the bridge to the future and the bridge to yesterday, and it gives you the power and the positivity of now. And that's how I live my life. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Great to hear that. Great to hear that. Now, get putting that show together, that, that movie together, talk about the cast. The cast? Oh, I, I brought together 27 young people. 27. Now, that's why I don't have hair. <laughs> uh, and it was Excuse fun. Me. <laughs> I ain't got none either. <laughs> but we they learned about history, they learned about Dr. King, they learned about Reverend Fred Shuttleworth, they learned about, you know, uh John Lewis, mm -hmm. and they was excited because I had to make sure they knew about history. And they learned about one of the most ruthless segregationist races of all time, Boa Connor. And so, um, like I said, I can't say this enough. That's one of the, they have done civil rights stories on almost every major event, but that one. So I wanted to be the first to do one on that one. And I want that to be a feature film. Wow. I really wanted to do a, a feature film. You have no idea about the power of our children. Hmm. And say, so how do you stay grounded? I, I read somewhere where, uh, Denzel said, you know, every morning, put your shoes under the bed so you can get on your knees. And I came from a place where we didn't have running water. We had a toilet. We didn't have electricity. We had lamps. And so wherever I am today is a long ways from where I was yesterday. And there were so many people that helped me. I'm here because people made the village work. And I think we have to go back to that village. I'm not ashamed to say that I am the product of those who fought before me to give me the right to have the things that I do. They gave me a baton and I would like to be able to give the baton to those coming after me. We didn't take the baton with a greasy hand. We held on to it. Yeah. So I want to make sure that those coming behind me don't hold it with a greasy hand and let their history slip before behind them. Okay. You know, as we had a picture up of some t-shirts, you got some t-shirts for sale. How can we get those t-shirts? By going to the sagoscompany.com. And that is, I'm raising money to give scholarships to kids and for my next short film. I started an organization called the Giving Back Corporation in 1997 where I honored the pioneers that were before me. And all of the money, all of it, goes to children. I pay for kids' books when they go to college. As of this past year, I gave 10 scholarships. I have helped 680-something kids through college. And I would like to say we did, the people who helped me help giving back. Hmm. I've been to your events when you try to raise money. And only because of the pandemic that you stopped. Are you going to get back to it again? Next year. Ah, come now, on. I may, I may have stopped the Toast Rose, which was the event. Yes, sir. But during the pandemic, I did not stop giving out the scholarships. I gave 10 scholarships every year. I did what I had to do. I made sure I continued to give out 
Uh, it's been three years. In three years, I have given out 30 scholarships to help kids. And I have this one goal. And my goal is that I want to give a scholarship to a student at every one of the historical black colleges. Watch me. That's what I'm going to do. I wish we had more time to talk, Ken. I want to thank you so much for being on our program today. I don't know how you do it, sir. But all I can say is keep it up. Keep because it up. of you. Because of you. <laughs> I'm just you're, so you're the wind under these wings. You're the wind <laughs> under these wings. Everybody, you're the wind under these wings. That's why I can fly. Please come back again. Please thank come you. back again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Sagos. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. We would like to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, that we're asking our Actors' Choice squad to help us get former baseball player Kurt Flood into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt passed away January 20th, 1997. He's the husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress Judy Pace. So all you got to do is contact our office, 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. Ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball player. Brother Tony. Well, how do I look, Rumo? Like you always do, Betsy, like trash. <laughs> Thanks, I just needed to hear you say it. Oh. Excuse me, is there a Betsy Baxter here? My family oh my are God. simple people. They're not cultured enough to appreciate any kind of class. Okay, Ramon, plug me in. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is an actor, director, and a playwright. Now, he's got a new play coming out called on October the 14th called Daddy Issues. The play was received critical acclaim where it was nominated for Best Off-Broadway Play by Broadway World. So... We're asking you to get your pen and paper ready so you can get some information from this gentleman who, who does who, what, where, when, and why. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Golden. David, oh. bless you, and welcome to the Actors' Choice. Thank you, Ron. I, when you saw that lady right there. That oh, my God, what a surprise. Where did you find that? I, I, do, I do my homework. I look for you it. Do. I, I, oh, my God, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, you went from 50 to 150 there with that. <laughs> like, whoa! That's what we do. <laughs> Nobody believes I did that sitcom because no one's ever seen it because it never <laughs> aired. Get out of here. No, Get it never aired. Here. They filmed uh. 16 episodes and it never aired. <laughs> Uh, David, uh, tell us where you were born, sir. I'm sorry? Where were you born? I was born in Bayside, Queens, but I don't remember it because I left when I was two months old. Mm, Bayside. <laughs> Bayside, Queens. Now, I was born and raised in New York City in Harlem, but I went to school in Queens where Bayside High School was. Well, guess what? I still what? have an apartment in Harlem. Get back. 113th and Frederick Douglass Boulevard. I know that. I know exactly where that is. That's where my apartment is. Right. Indeed. As they say, as Bobby Womack used to say, cross 110th Street, you're in Harlem. That's right. <laughs> what made you get into this business? Oh, God. I don't think I ever had a choice. Um, I saw Oliver when I was eight years old, and that's and I wanted to be one of those poor, starving orphans in Oliver, except I was a fat kid. So if I said, please, sir, I want some more, they would have said, don't you think you've had enough? But... That's why that was my initial reasoning for going into the theater. Nice. I just fell in love with Oliver. Got you. Over the years, you've been a doggone good actor, sir. How Thank do you, you become sir. a better actor or director? How do you do that? How do you become a better actor or director? I think I'm the best director I've ever been. I'm listening more to my actors. I'm more in tune with my actors. I zero in on them and I see what they're thinking and what they're needing. And I think the more I'm in tune with my actor, like I pretend that I'm them, the better director I'll be. And then I step back as a director and use my paintbrushes to make them be the best actor they can be within the framework of my play. Wow, you've done some good work. I mean, we just saw you on, we just saw you on, on radio there or TV uh, doing some good work. Um, with Dolly Parton and everything, but you have got, so I got to ask you, what's it like when you get on a set or stage? What's it like? 
Well, with the Dolly Parton series, I was a nervous wreck because <laughs> it was my first big job. Yes. There I was in front of a studio audience. I'm working with Dolly Parton. Yes. I, had my, my, I was playing a hairdresser. I had my brushes in hand. I thought they were going to fly all over the place. And Dolly said, oh, David's nervous. Look at David. He's so nervous. And she, she was right. I was nervous. But it was exciting. You know, you relax in and you create your, as I just said to my actors, we were talking about the fourth wall and I finally admitted, because we have a young actor who's nine mm -hmm. and he tends to look at the audience. So I had explained the idea of the fourth wall and I did where you put your, your window here and a picture here and he couldn't get that. And then I thought about it and I thought, in all the years of acting, David, have you ever really successfully created a fourth wall? And so I changed it. You know what? Just stay in your line of play. If you stay in your line of play, you're right. In other words, the audience is looking in, you're not talk, listening to them, mm -hmm. but if you stay in your line of play, you're okay. And another actor suggested another way to do it is instead of creating your fourth wall, put things up there that you like. So we had this big discussion about the fourth wall. I don't know why we went there, but we went there. Yeah, interesting. I was gonna say the fourth wall, fourth wall, okay. But to a nine-year-old, if you just create your line of play, yes, mommy's here, daddy's here, and the audience is not there, that will suffice. And I think, to be honest, I've never really successfully created a fourth wall. I've always stayed in my line of play. Okay. You do know journalists, but they call it the fourth estate in their, in their work. The what? I'm sorry? The, the uh, journalists like to call it the fourth estate. Yes. Yes. It's a notion that they do. I see that you were in a TV movie called Saved by the Light. Starring I was. Eric Roberts. He was such a nice guy. Yeah. Such a nice man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a cute line, a couple of lines. It got cut. <laughs> you know, I was a new age salesman. It was like, and he came up, Eric Roberts came up to me and goes, well, what is this, what is this, um, what is this cure? And my answer was, what do you got? What you got? <laughs> what do you got? So that was my, that was my, but he was such a nice guy. It was a nice experience. Now I ran across one of your films called David Golden Father's Day. Remember that one? Yes. Roll it, Tony. <laughs> uh, My most terrible time. time. I have two baseball scene. players. They rape to fan. They make two million dollars. They can't show. afford a hooker. My biggest hockey that player so has Bolivia up his nose. It. In the middle of all this, you want me to take the kids for eight so weeks? I, I can, they're Be not hearing serious, me. Carol. Ben, Cleo, let's do it. You have got them for the summer. You figure it out. You drop this bomb on me now. I like this. No consideration from a lot. Interesting. Thank you, sir. Wow. And I see you working on another project called Black Jack at the Moulin Rouge, now in development. Yes, it is. It was actually optioned. It's a wonderful piece. Unlike Daddy Issues, totally researched, no biography. It's about the integration of the Las Vegas Strip circa 1955 to 60. Mm -hmm. I'll give you my pitch. Why not? Hit me. Hit me. It's 1955. Dr. James McMillan... Las Vegas' first black dentist arrives to find out that African-Americans cannot stay or eat or watch a show on a Las Vegas strip. Even if you were Pearl Bailey or Harry Belafonte or Sammy Davis Jr., you had to stay on the west side of L.A. Now, the west side of L.A. was, was booming because African-Americans like to party too. So three white entrepreneurs discover this and decide they're gonna open the first integrated casino, the Moulin Rouge Hotel and Casino. It is a huge hit. Frank Sinatra sings there with Judy Garland, with Sammy Davis Jr. It's on the cover, this is a true story. It's on the cover of Life Magazine in May of 1955. Six months later, it mysteriously closes, causing a civil rights battle led by our black dentist james mcmillan which changes the las vegas strip forever it's a true story it's a research story and it needs to be done we have i have a movie script and i have a um series i have two three years of bible and two episodes already done wow. so that's waiting to happen too looks like good work is coming looks like oh good yeah it's coming yeah. definitely David, I see you also worked at the acting studio company as a producing artistic director in Orlando, Florida, 1990 yes. to 1997. Yes. Wow. Uh, yes, I worked at Universal Studios in 1990. We opened up their um, 
their theme park and I met Angie Dickinson and Charlton Heston and and Steven Spielberg, amazing people we met. Oh, Linda Blair. Yeah. And I realized that uh, Orlando needed an acting school. So I opened an acting school in theater called the Acting Studio Company. Um, it actually started, it ended up being an actual theater at some point, but I actually started it in, a, uh, in an apartment complex. And my manager at the time, my agent at the time, sent me 30 students. So I had three classes a week in an apartment complex. And then I bought, bit the bullet six months later and got funds and opened a theater in an acting school. It was very, it was a lot, it was really great. It was a really great experience. You see Florida had, uh, Ian hit it hard, didn't it? Oh my God, the west side of Florida, poor Florida. Yeah. I have a place on the east side of Florida. We're okay, thank God, but still. You know, you, every time a hurricane comes, you go, whew, missed me or got me or whatever. I did, there was a hurricane that actually did hurt my house about when I first moved to Florida. I forgot the name of the hurricane, but it blew down our fence and it did something to the roof. So I've had it both ways. I've been hit and non-hit. David, you came here for some business. Got a new play. Ladies and gentlemen, get your pen and pencil. I get some information from this young man. Daddy Issues, the play. The website is www.daddyissuestheplay.com. It was in New York twice, off off Broadway and off Broadway. It was in Orlando. It was in Fort Lauderdale, and it was in Boca Raton. Did well in every city. Uh, the reviews were always, almost always, hilarious, heartfelt, and they would say, "This should, you know what? This should be a sitcom. It's it should run forever as a sitcom." So we're in LA hoping the powers that be come and make it a sitcom. If not, I get to see my life on stage one more time. And what's so what's so bad about that? You know, I was in rehearsal the other day and I'm thinking, shoot, this is my life on the stage. And these actors are doing it for me, not for an audience, just for me, the director, actor, writer. Is this cool or what? And I never had that before. It was such an up. It was such an up. And the play is such an up. It's a happy, happy play about accepting your children for who they are and parent and kids learning to deal with their parents. So <laughs> daddy issues. So it was close to your life. Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely half of it is biographical, half of it is made up. We happen to have a picture of the cast. Do we? Yes, we do. <laughs> Yay! Oh my God, they're so good. They are, I have the best cast. I am so blessed. Although I got, I was a little bitchy yesterday at rehearsal. I hope they forgive me. But we have a great cast, left to right. We have Noah Lev, I never can say her name. She's just, she's from Noah Lev Ari as Henrietta. We have Sherry Michaels as Grandma Moskowitz. Solly Warner, who's nine and a half years old, playing Johnny Walker. His mom, Hannah Battersby, is to his right. In the middle is James Seifert. On the right in drag, we have Josh, oh my God, Josh Nader, Nadler, Nadler. Next, in, then we have Marion Moskowitz. That's Pamela Shaw playing my mom. And it's scary how close to my mom she is. It's really scary. And next to her, we have uh, Jonathan Fishman as Sid Moskowitz. Every one of these actors should be working a lot. They are, I am so blessed with this cast. Wow. What excites you the most about this play? <laughs> wow. Well, I think it talks to parents about how being a better, to be a better parent. And it talks to kids or people how to deal with the expectations of their parents. And it's also about how we make new families in life. We have our real families which are mom, dad, and grandma. But then we have our new families, which are our best friend. Uh, Donald Moskowitz finds Henrietta and Levi. Henrietta is um, John Donald's best girlfriend forever. Um, and, and Levi is his drag queen friend. And they are a family unit in themselves. And within the course of the play, there's another family formed. The play, it excites me because the play is about finding family wherever you are and finding a new family, uh, cherishing your old family and being one and whole. It's really, spiritually, that's what it means to me. Super, super. They, finding they, when does the play run? From October the... October 14th to November 13th. 
And Friday, Friday Saturday, eight o'clock, uh-huh. Monday at five, and one Thursday, October twentieth at eight p.m. And it's five weeks. Okay. Where's what theater are you going to be in? It is at the Dory Theater at the Complex. I'm going to read the address because I never remember these things. 6476 <laughs> Santa Monica Boulevard. And you can get tickets at daddyissuestheplay.com. Okay. There's also a phone number if you want that. Nah, just go to Daddy Issues. You, get more <laughs> you got a website? Also. We do. Daddy Issues the Play is the website. Right. .com. Yeah. It's a website. It's got the cast on there. It's got a video on there. Ooh, I, I, didn't, I just got that video. I should have sent you that video. Oh, well. I, oh, well. And you we have a little until, promo video we just did. Got you. And you run until November the 13th? Yes, sir. Hopefully you'll take it past November 13th. Well, I'm hoping it becomes a TV show. That's yes. my heartfelt wish. And it could happen. It sure I can. Hope. It sure can. Again, can you tell people where that playhouse is, please? And dates, it's places? on a Hollywood and, oh God, it's on a it's Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. Cole, I think it's Cole close to Gore. Is that right? Is it Cole close and Wal- to and Wal- Wal- Gower? Well, yeah. somewhere be uh, Santa Monica Boulevard near Gower. Okay, yeah, near Gower. Cole and, and, and Wilcox. Yes. Yeah. 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 And dates again? I'm sorry. Oh, the dates. The dates. Again. October thirteenth to November. No, that's not right. October fourteen <laughs> to November twenty. Friday, Saturday at 8, Sunday at 5. One Thursday at 8, October 20th. Name of the play again, sir? Daddy Issues. Daddy Issues. I like that. Basically, how far will a gay guy go to please his overbearing Jewish parents? And it speaks to everyone. Every ethnicity loves this play. You know, you don't have to be Jewish. (laughs) And one reviewer said, whatever team you play for, go. It's hilarious. Uh. So whether you're gay, straight, Jewish, I don't know, Catholic, Muslim, it's all about family issues. <laughs> David, you are too much. You are quite a guy. I am too much. <laughs> I've told that before. I want to thank you so much for coming here today. I hope that folks got all the information that they need to see to play Daddy Issues. And please thank our favorite publicist, if you would, you know, Lucy Pollock. We love lady. her. Fantastic. Love her, she always makes it possible. God bless yep. her. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, David Golden. Bye, everyone. Thank you. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Roll it, Tony. Oh, excuse me. Don't roll it. Don't roll it. Don't roll it. Roco. Got to get that Roco in there. Uh, we just got some good news, ladies and gentlemen, that we want to share with you. Thank you, t- thank you, Tony. Well, last Thursday, so on, on Thursday last month, uh, the United Broadcasting Network, or UBNGO, Roku Channel, was launched. And we are very, very excited. We have a great lineup of UBNG content the program, including this program, The Actor's Choice. So get your information. Go to programming at ubngo.com. That's programming at w, excuse me, at ubngo.com. Okay? Thank you, Tony. Roll it. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is well known here in Los Angeles, California, and all around the world for his extremely generous spirit that he has shared with many, many people. Now, this man has done so many things. You ready for this, folks? An accountant for over 40 years, a flight attendant, an emergency medical technician, a special events medic at Disneyland, and oh yeah, co-developer and producer of Playhouse Theater Players. I could go on and on and on, but we have limited time. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one, the only, Chester A. Green III. Chester, greetings and welcome to the Actors' Choice, brother. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so very much for having me. Uh, Oh, I wouldn't have it any other way. What a guy. What a guy. I feel honored. You is honored. I'm honored too. Even so, where were you born, my brother? 
Where was I born? Yes. I, I was born in Columbus, Ohio on a Monday. It was raining and it was in the evening. <laughs> How about that? Right. Right. <laughs> oh, Columbus, Ohio. I used to go, I went to a place called Urban Crest right near Columbia, not too far from Columbus. I yes. know where that is. Yes, we went through that years ago. <laughs> okay, folks, now, we, 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 we can't, we, hold on. We can't go any further without mentioning the name of the lady who stands with Chester. I give you Sharon L. Grain. Uh, there she is. Beautiful lady. Beautiful, beautiful lady. And guess what, folks? These two guys have been together for how many years, sir? Uh, 55. 55, as we call it. 55. 55. <laughs> That's a long, long time. My God. God bless you guys. Woo! How did you do it? How do you do it? She is a great partner. Um, her enthusiasm about life and all that she does is just, it draws you into it. Even mm -hmm. though you don't want to do it, uh, she's very convincing and uh, it's great. It's, wow. it's been a good 55. Looking for 55 more. <laughs> wow. wow. So when and how did you two guys meet? Well, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, um, I hadn't been out of the Air Force for more than about two years. And I was in the apartment building. So I, I was with my parents for just a while. My first cousin, who was uh, dating her brother, brought her over to the house to meet me. And my mom said, why don't you get the guy some pizza? Well, I don't really want to be bothered. But you know, Sharon, she said, well, I'm going with you. And I'm going to, <laughs> and believe it or not, believe it or not, from that point forward, that first meeting, it was like instant. And it wasn't more than six months after that we were married. Wow. <laughs> Marriages today are not like they were yesterday. <laughs> I've been married three times, so I, I can say that. <laughs> oh, hey, I'll take your word for that. Uh, no, but brother, he, he's been married four times, so we can take a look at that. Wow. One of, the, one of the projects that you guys did was House on the Hill. Uh-huh. Can you tell us about that one? I certainly can. Uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant, a lot of people hadn't heard about her. Sharon yep. did some research on her. Um, that was instituted or began by um, uh, one of her uh, individuals that she, um, Mamie Clayton was actually. Yes, Mamie Clayton, yes, okay. And so Sharon got in and did the research about this woman who was the first black uh, female and millionaire, uh, not Madam C.J. Walker, right. but Mary Ellen Pleasant in 1857 had amassed the fortune of over $3 million, uh, $30 million. She was also through the Omni Railroad Company. Well, enough of the history of Mary Ellen, but what happened, Sharon got to play. It was in rehearsal, it was in rehearsal. I'm doing sound. Okay. She gets a call. The individual that's going to play one of those characters dropped out. Now, this is the day before the show goes up. Got you. Day before. So uh day before the show goes up and uh he can't make it. Can't come. He's in San Diego. So Sharon says, Well, we all here have to act. Chat, come down here. You're gonna be William. <laughs> oh crap. You know, the sweat but you know, just thinking about that moment right now still gives me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened the next day? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, with Mary Ellen. Uh, she said, I want you to, um, you're going to be reading it because obviously you don't know the script and it's very wordy. <laughs> so I said, okay. So what had happened, everyone else on the stage, uh, well, before we started the play, she asked the audience, um, we can do this. We're going to do this evening as a reading. And if you're not satisfied with that, we will return your money. Well, they all said they wanted to stay. So they acted like they were reading. They knew their script. And I was reading. Got you. So by the very next week, I'd memorized the script. And 
the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> okay. And then there was diva when divas were was divas. That is an exciting experience. Again, I get a little goose pimply over that. I'm not in it, but I was doing the audio and visual tech from the booth. But what had happened, Sharon had written that play several times. Okay. And each time the script was just gone out of the computer. Gotcha. Gone. Finally, uh, she got one that she could deal with uh, and got these young ladies to perform in it, which is excellent. Um, the individuals, the five ladies that are, are in Divas for Divas. But we were able to go with that play to Edinburgh, Scotland and perform for a week there uh, to outstanding crowd participation and okay. working with the people. It was really great. Okay. It was really great. Now, I understand that the Playhouse Theatre Players Golden Age of Radio, which you founded with your wife, won many awards for your performances, I do well, actually, it did, but it started off real unusual. <laughs> Let me tell you, leave it to seniors to tell you if you're doing something right or wrong. Okay. Uh, when we were doing that uh, radio dramas all over, uh, I was doing them out of my band. I would go and actually set up a whole black box stage, sound, lights, everything, then and then perform as Foley, uh, the guy doing all of the sound effects. Well, the first thing the audience told us after the play and the audience were sparse to begin with was, you know, you guys aren't reading, you're memorizing. And they said, they didn't memorize, they read the script. And they just, and you got to get up close to the mic. And well, we took all of this to heart. And when we finally did it in front of a local community TV station in Torrance, California, we got brave reviews over it. Sharon did it. The difference of what Sharon did with that Yes. Not only did we read it on stage, we dressed in the clothes of that period as we did it on stage. And uh, I tried to create all the Foley devices I could to make all the sounds or there were gunshots, door slamming, all of this kind of thing. And it really just took off. So we were in quite big demand for a while with that show. But all because of Sharon <laughs> and, wow. and pushing us to do our best. <laughs> It was uh, the golden age of radio. Please explain what that is, please. Okay. What the golden age of radio is, is doing those radio shows from the late 1930s through the 40s. Uh -huh. um, um, Molly McGee and all of those. We did Jack <laughs> Benny. Chuck Nows was our Jack Benny, by the way. <laughs> and he was awesome. All those radio shows of the period, even including one, uh, The Lone Ranger, in which I got to play The Lone Ranger. Well, on the radio, all you have to do is try to get that voice just right. Right. And it My works. old silver. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I'm on big guy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, we did all of those. And Sharon wrote some of the scripts and yes. created some of those characters. We didn't just um, piggyback on characters of the past. She created quite a few. And uh, the audiences just, just loved it. Okay. Chester, we got some photos that we want to share with you. Tony, oh, can you wow. start with the uh, El Camino College? Oh, boy. <laughs> there he is. EMT. Yeah. You're qualified EMT to, to that, this day? That was, you know, that was another interesting career turn. For me. Um, again, I can contribute to Sharon. Uh, we were doing volunteer work at Disneyland. I saw the guys running around in these things and, and helping people, which I love to do. Uh -huh. And I said, I'm going to do that. So I went to El Camino and became a licensed EMT. And at the same time I was doing that, Disney picked me up as one of his teams on, what, on the ending shoot of a half marathon race, a special event. Yes. What happened? Is my very first individual coming over the line, I said, um, are you OK? A, a full coronary arrest right there on the spot. Uh -huh. And we had to arrive, uh, revive this guy right on the spot. Luckily, to this day, that fellow and I, we still stay in contact. And he's doing well. Excellent. Excellent. 
<laughs> next photo. Next photo, please. <laughs> there you go. The loving word, men's ministry. I was a liturgical dancer for um, First Amy Church. Right. I also danced with Michelle Obama uh, when she came out here. Uh, and not only um, at First AME, but other churches around the city. Okay. That was a great experience. Gotcha. Speaking <laughs> of Obama, here's another picture. You might remember this one. Oh, yes. I'm down there. Right. I had it. That was right before he was going to become president. He, <laughs> they all seemed to want to come to First AME. And I was down there in awe. And afterwards, I had a chance to shake his hand and and say hi. <laughs> that's you on the left left plate. That's that's just on the left side there. First yeah, row. Right yeah, right in the left in the front row. I was front a row. tenor. That choir is called the Men of Fame Choir, and I was a one of the tenors in that choir. Okay. Next photo. Here you are playing oh. basketball for the United States Air Force. <laughs> Let me tell you. That was in like 1963, playing Ooh. basketball in the Air Force. I really enjoyed that. You know, what was amazing about that team, our tallest man was 6'2". I'm 5'10", but all of us in those days could dunk the ball. <laughs> and we went on to win Portland Air Defense Sector and various other championships. So we did Real well. I really enjoyed that. That was awesome. <laughs> Next picture shows the Grain family. How all of the family, your father, your brother, you have all served our country. And we well, let you. me add something to that photo. Uh, my stepbrother, um, who's not with us now, he was a Navy SEAL. Uh, and also my nephew was with the Coast Guard. Okay. So we represent, in that picture, my father, myself, and my brother, brother, Marine Corps, father, Army, and I was Air Force. We represent all the branches of, of the service within mm -hmm. our immediate family. So I thank them all for their service as well. Wow. Next one, please. Ah, you and your beautiful wife. <laughs> Down that picture. That's my girl. That's my girl. But let me tell you, behind all of these things, other than the Air Force things, which were before we met, she has been very instrumental in where I have gotten to in this life. If it would not have been for her, I wouldn't have graduated and got my bachelor's degree. I was ready to throw up my hands. And, but Sharon said, you can do it. And, and I finished with honors. But it was because of her that pushed me through that. And to everything involving acting and that, it's been her. Um, I have to attribute it all to her. And uh, a great spirit. Amen. Amen. What's next? What's going on? You guys got any plans for a play or anything like that? You know, uh, there's a play that Sharon wrote, Dorothy and Otto, the Dorothy Dandridge Affair. And we are going to be doing that in the last week of March and through April this coming year at the City Garage Theater in Santa Monica. And so we're in preparation now, uh, as you do well in advance of going live, of getting everything in place for that production. Um, the two actors in it are outstanding. One of them you've had on your show already, Shelly. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Shelly Boone. She yes. is an incredible as Dorothy Dandridge. And we have another gentleman who is going to be great as the as the other character, obviously. So wow. it's going to be a great show. You guys have moved around to a lot of venues, didn't you? Oh, good gracious. Um, in the Palace, and uh, excuse me, in the Long Beach uh, yes. Theater, we did Broadway in L.A. I, 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 we did the Palace in L.A. We've done venues all over L.A. I was very impressed with Sharon's Broadway and LA show. That was amazing. Um, we had certain actors fly in from New York just to be part of the show because Sharon asked them to come. Um, and then uh, at the Palace in, in LA, we did shows. Um, uh, we did shows in, in, in Watts Wider's workshop. And, uh, worked with her in shows there in, in the early 70s, um, all over LA. 
Rock Riders Workshop, you know, that one. And um, all over. Worked with so many people. I just can't think of all the names of them. <laughs> Give you a name real quick. We miss her. Barbara Morris. Oh. She, um, you know, well, you don't know, so I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she was with us. She played a character in our uh, play, uh, When Divas Were Divas, when we went to Edinburgh. And, and she, of course, was outstanding. She mm -hmm. always is outstanding. She can go to whatever when she hits the stage. She's remarkable. I was sitting with her and helping her put on one, her leg. She had lost her leg, so I was helping her put on one of her prosthesis. And I said, Barbara, you are a true celebrity. I know people don't say it so much, but I'm very honored, very honored that you allow me to work. And she sort of hugged me, and then we moved on from there. But she was truly my heart. We truly miss her. Her spirit and her talent is just incredible. And what a storyteller. She can tell a story and have you rolling on the floor and then sing you one of the most beautiful songs you've ever heard. She was an incredible. And I, we truly miss her. L.A. will miss her. The world will miss her talent. Yes, indeed. Just a grain the third, we miss you. Thank you very much, sir, my friend, for being here, for what you do, and thank you for what you've done. The best you and Sharon. May God bless you both. And please, come back again, please. Oh, I will, and I'm so honored you had me this time, Ron. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Chester. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Brandman, uh, Photography as an Art, Ron Irwin's Lose Life, The Way to Lose Weight, Larry Buford's Book to the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm agent Carla Green, and veteran actor Rob Brownstein's acting training school and actor's space. And much thanks, much thanks to our guest today, actor, producer, director Ken Segos, actor, director, playwright David Golden, and producer, actor, and what a guy, Chester A. Green III. And of course, special thanks to our ever-growing audience. Be well. We will see you next time.